So it is, oh, uh, is today? Today is July 21st. I don't think there's anything July 21st history related. Nothing that's coming to my brain right now. Um, nothing that's really sticking. There's, there's nothing like the steel day or anything fancy that I can think of. I'm sure there's something in history today, but there's probably, there may be, maybe some of these have their birthday today. I don't know. No, I don't think so. I think I looked. I don't think anyone's got a birthday today. But last we met, or not met, but talked virtually, we had fin I finished the subject about solids mass, or solids and liquids and gases. And then I had done the lecture on heat. And the one thing, if you notice, that I kept repeating in that lecture, because it's probably something important to get in order to kind of move on to this. And also, it's going to be important for us when we start talking about modalities in physics or in therapy is dealing with physics is that heat does not spontaneously go from an area of cold to an area of hot. It only flows from hot to cold. That's, that's one of the principal laws. We're going to talk today about the laws of thermodynamics. It's one of the principal laws of heat is that heat doesn't flow spontaneously from an area of colder temperature to an area of warmer temperature. It just doesn't happen. The only way we can do that is by putting energy into it. Um, and I joked about, you know, because again, I'm going to use a lot of my family as reference for a lot of my classes because I have a very interesting family. If uh, any of you have ever been to Appalachia or back in the East Coast where, you know, you, you go to a place where if the banjo plays, you get a little scared. My dad always used to scream at us during the winter when the air conditioning was on. Don't you open that door. You're going to let the air conditioning out. And like after I take my first physics class, I'm like, well, dad, that's not really the way it works. Technically, I'm letting the heat in and it's mixing. And then I get something thrown on my head. Um, that's about how my family went. So it doesn't you know, work that way. Now, if you're in winter and your house is warm and you open the door, yeah, then the heat will attempt to escape the house and go out, right? But taking that into like structures of houses and houses and cars and like that, how do we then keep like the air conditioning in or the heat out? How do we do that? What do we use to do that? Like I'm sitting in my apartment now and it's a nice, cool, about, what does my temperature say here? About 77 degrees. Yeah, insulation, right, Josh? Exactly. We have, our houses are protected. Now my, the, my apartment is well insulated because I have one of the old school, like built in the 1940s style apartments. So I don't even have insulation. The whole building is concrete, right? Now the positive note is when my air conditioning's on, it keeps the apartment cool, but I have a Western facing apartment. So as the sun comes across and crests the horizon, that sun beats against those concrete stones and those concrete stones warm up. And then at night in my apartment, it's really hard to keep it cool because those stones have a fairly good absorbance of heat. And I mentioned that as well in last lecture. Do you remember what I said? Why, why do some objects, what's that term that we use that determines how well an object either heats up or cools down? For those of you that watched it, because I, I know most of you watched it. Specific heat, yeah, right? And we're gonna use that in physical therapy quite a bit because we can use stuff like uh, therapy pools to reduce inflammation. Um, we can use contrast baths to reduce swelling because water itself has a really high specific heat. You know, have any of you ever gone swimming and it's outside, it's 102 degrees, 112 degrees, 120 degrees. You get in the pool, the water feels nice, and then you stand up in the pool and you're like, oh God, it's cold, right? Because the air feels cold for some reason. You're like, what's well, this is weird? It's 112 degrees outside. Well, what happened is because the water has that specific heat, when you go in it, it likes to sap that heat from you, right? It reduces your overall body temperature. That's why swimming makes you feel so nice and kind of cool and calm down versus the thousand degree weather that we have out here, you know, Mercury side of the sun or uh, sun side of Mercury, right? So water is very good at doing that. Well, I mentioned also in the lecture that water does that and that's what causes our climate, right? Does anyone, does anyone here live in San Diego before or has been to San Diego frequently? I was down there 
right before, yes, yeah, Josh says he has, right? Yeah, right? I've been, I, I go down there once a year, unfortunately. It hasn't been for two years because there's one thing that happens in San Diego every year that is perfect for a nerd and a geek like me. Does anyone know what that, hap that thing is that happens in San Diego? Yes, Comic-Con. That is the ultimate test of nerdery. Uh, I go every year and I love it. And it's just, it is a mecca for stuff like that. And I better have lots of money because I usually come home with lots of stuff I didn't need. Um, last time that I went was about two years ago, which was the last Comic-Con we had. And I actually went down there as a rep for Magic Wheelchair, which was loads of fun. Um, but yeah, so the thing about San Diego is if you look at where it is on the map, you would think that San Diego would be an uncomfortable hellscape because it's right at kind of that same level as like the Salton Sea. And even I think it's on level with Tucson, if I remember correctly. And both those areas are ungodly hot. But because San Diego is on the ocean, the ocean gives it a very mild climate. It's a really nice place to live, right? I mean, I, I, I thought about it before living there, but the cost of living is stupid high. Um, and I don't like paying, you know, $1.4 million for a 900 square foot house, which is probably true. I, I'm just making that number up, but I, I wouldn't doubt that's true. So that the ocean keeps San Diego a very mild climate. Right. right now, we're having a little problem with that on the West Coast, right? Because everyone's seen that the West Coast is pretty much getting bombarded with heat and it's causing all kinds of wildfires. And I don't know if any of you have seen, have any of you seen the pictures from New York lately? Did anyone see the news on that? So New York is actually covered in a blanket of smoke from the Pacific Northwest. Think about that for a second. New York has a blanket of smoke over it from the Pacific Northwest. I don't know about you, but that's crazy to me, right? That means those wildfires that are happening up in the Pacific Northwest, all that smoke has traveled the whole way across our country. Actually, I've traveled across Canada, right? But that also goes back to that lecture I had last time. It's the idea that an area of high pressure can take stuff and travel because it's going to try to seek an area of low pressure. That's kind of the same idea. So that's Mr. McKeever's review of the last kind of lesson there. Let's get into talking about thermodynamics. This is one of my favorite lectures actually of the semester because I actually like thermodynamics. I'm a weird person. Actually, you guys don't know if you noticed, but I kind of like physics. I'm totally nerding out, but I really like physics. I hope, and I'm hoping, and no one has said it, complained to me yet, but I'm hoping that I've made physics at least a little bit more fun for you guys than just the droll plain learning physics. All right, so let's talk thermodynamics. So let's break that word down really quick. Thermo is dealing with temperature, right? That when we say thermo, a lot of people, when they think thermo, they think heat, right? Like my cup here is thermally insulated. It keeps my wonderful life giving coffee warm. But it's not necessarily that it keeps it warm. What thermal insulator means is it keeps the temperature, whatever it is, consistent, right? So thermo meaning temperature. What does dynamics mean? Breaking those down back to your, uh, yeah, movement, right? Movement of things, change. And really, if you look at it by, by the rule of law of the Greeks, it's change of movement, right? So it's the idea of how temperature will change and fluctuate. That's kind of what thermodynamics is. I know it's an exciting thing. We're going to talk again a little bit about transfer heat and then get into the law of thermodynamics and talk about chaos theory. That's one of my favorite things to talk about in this class and a little bit about climate change. So I know that somebody's going to get mad at me. So I already apologize in advance. So we talked last time, or I talked last time at the computer about the conduction of heat, right? It's transfer of energy within the materials between contact with different materials. If materials transfer heat very well, they're known as heat conductors. An example of that would be a good cast iron pot, right? Or a cast iron skillet. I have a really nice cast iron skillet in my kitchen that I've had for years. And I've used it because it's a really good conductor of heat. And you know, I can sear steaks really nice with it. Mm, steaks. Somebody here is getting mad because I talked about cow, but I'm sorry for you vegetarians. I'm not a vegetarian or a vegan. 
radiation of heat is transmitted by the electromagnetic waves. Radiation from the sun is our primary light that we receive, right? All of us have that, or at least some of us, I'm not necessarily me. You go outside and that first time that sun rays hit you, you're like, oh, that feels good, right? That first time it hits you and then you're like, okay, you can stop screaming at me, sun. You're a little too warm. But that's that radiation of heat. Everything radiates heat in a small amount, right? I don't know if any of you like me run really warm but I'm one of those people that runs really warm. Um, on my flight down to Tucson, like four weeks ago, I was flying down and there was this lady that was sitting beside me and she like taps me on my shoulder, took my, my earbud out and she's like, you just absolutely radiate heat. I'm like, I know, I'm hot. And she kind of laughed about it. She goes, I've never felt somebody that gives off as much heat as you do. And I just, I'm just a warm person by nature. Uh, not warm in heart, warm in temperature. So we all radiate heat. Probably some of you might have significant others that when you go to bed at night, you're like, nope, stay as far away from me as you possibly can. You are like an inferno. Just stay on that side of the bed. Stay on that side of the bed. That was what my wife used to tell me. It's like, okay, this is the line you shall not cross. You stay on that side and keep your thermonuclear temperature over there. So the study of heat and the transformation in mechanical energy or the transfer of heat is thermodynamics. It's the movement of heat. So the foundation of thermodynamics is the conservation of energy and that heat flows from hot to cold. It provides the basic theory of heat engines. Do any of you have a heat engine in your home? What do you think? Are you willing to bet most of us have a heat engine in our home? What kind of heat engine do we have? A heater and an air conditioner, believe it or not. They're both heat engines. Your car itself is a heat engine. Water heater is another one, great example, right? So all this, I mean, all this, um, and I was, I was actually, it's funny, I'm, I'm going to be on one of the debates coming up for uh, one of the flat earth. Um, so maybe I'll give you that link once I get it. One of the debates coming up in the near future. This is one of my, my humor here. I know I pick on flat earthers a lot here, but I apologize. It's just kind of funny to me because a lot of flat earthers deny physics, but yet they're going to use the benefits of physics by heaters, air conditioners, and water heaters and cars, right? Physics leads to all of that. So absolute zero. As the temperature and thermal motion of atoms in a substance approaches zero, the kinetic energy of the atoms approaches zero as well. And the temperature of the substance approaches the lower limit. As thermal motion of the atoms increases, the temperature increases. So as motion in atoms either increases or decreases, the internal energy of that item is going to change. It's also going to affect the heat. There doesn't seem to be an upper limit of temperature that we found yet. Right? We haven't found this upper type limit of heat, but we have found the lower limit. Right, we found where temperature stops, right? And that temperature is absolute zero. We have never really attained absolute zero. We've gotten really close, right? But at absolute zero, all molecular movement stops. So theoretically, based upon you know research that, and again, because we haven't reached absolute zero because it's really impossible. Theoretically, the thought process is at absolute zero, the electrons will literally fall off their orbit. Because what keeps them around the, the nucleus is that constant movement and the gravitational pull of the nucleus. If movement stops, there's no gravitational pull. Those electrons should literally collapse. Um, this is where I kind of get kind of geeky again, um, because absolute zero itself, it, for the, those of you that are, I don't do I have any DC comic fans here? Let's just say that. How about that? Are there any comic book geeks in here, or is it just me? I hope I have one. Okay, Josh, good. Marvel only? Ah. I can deal with Marvel, but I'm more of a DC guy. Um, and Marvel in, in DC, and since the, the revamping of DC, the most powerful character in the DC universe is the Flash. Because the Flash can alter time itself, right? The Flash is super fast. If you've seen any of the TV shows, you've seen the Flash. Right, the cosmic treadmill, exactly, right? Does anyone know who the Flash's ultimate enemy is? Let's see if Josh knows this, because now I'm testing Josh's comic knowledge. 
technically not, believe it or not. That that is his like nemesis, right? Zoom. But really, his alter ego is Captain Cold. Because Captain Cold is the master of absolute zero. They designed this, the guy that originally wrote The Flash was a physics writer, right? Leonard Snart, yeah. But the guy that wrote the original comic said, well, if The Flash exists, there has to be somebody that's able to master the temperature so much that it stops all molecular movement. And so he came up with these two diametrically opposed enemies, which is actually kind of cool to me. I don't know. That's, that's my nerd geeking out, right? They call him the master of absolute zero, which would make sense. If Flash is the movement of all molecules and he can stop all movement, they would be opposed to each other, which is kind of cool. So again, that's, I'll stop geeking now. But at absolute zero, there's no further lowering temperature available. Sub stop. So the temperature is 273 degrees below Celsius or zero on the Kelvin scale, right? And again, unlike on Celsius scale, there are no negatives on the thermodynamic scale of Kelvin. It just goes from zero up to whatever it is. So ice melts at zero degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin and boils at 100 Celsius or 373 degrees Kelvin. This kind of is interesting. This chart on the left side here kind of makes me, I always like looking at it. Because if you look, you know, oxygen boils down here at 100 degrees Kelvin or 100 degrees Celsius about... Uh, 373 degrees Kelvin, right? But if you look up here, the sun, look at the temperature of the sun. The sun is 6,000 degrees Kelvin. That to me is just crazy, right? That's a, I, I can't even contemplate that, right? And then we've got plasma up here at 20,000 degrees. And we know when a hydrogen bomb goes off at the core of that hydrogen bomb, when it goes off, so, you know, I don't like to think about this, but if we think back to history and think of, you know, Nagasaki, right, at the core where that hydrogen bomb went off, at the very, very middle where it went off, the temperature was over 100 million degrees Kelvin. That is definitely not sustainable for life, right? That is literally, uh, and, and actually there's a lot of studies that show that when that hydrogen bomb went off, literally items were atomized instantly. And I don't know about you guys, but it kind of terrifies. I, I mean, I'm big into science, but nuclear weapons kind of terrify me. And when you think about the fact that literally that bomb, if it goes off near you, will atomize you. You'll be, you're actually more than atomized. You break your atoms down into its component parts. So electrons, protons, everything fly everywhere. That just kind of amazes me. It just really is, I don't know, this stuff makes me neat. I don't know. Okay, fine. No one else is geeking out like that. I'll, I'll move on. So the concept in practice, a sample of hydrogen gas has temperature about zero degrees Celsius. If the gas is heated into the molecules have double their kinetic energy, right? We are going to look at it and go, okay, well, if it's at zero degrees Celsius and it has one kinet level of kinetic energy. In order to double it, we have to double the temperature. So we'd have to bring that same amount of hydrogen gas up to 546 degrees Kelvin, right? So that would be the way we would do it. So Kelvin is how we measure that kind of internal energy and temperature. So the first law of thermodynamics states that whenever heat is added to a system, it transforms into an equal amount of some other energy, right? In 18th century, we used to think of heat as this invisible fluid called a caloric, which is where we get that term calorie from which flowed like water from hot objects to cold objects. And then James Joule came around, who just came up with the joules, and demonstrated the flow of heat was nothing more than the flow of energy itself. So we didn't say that there's fluid flowing around. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna get into that real quick because that would take me an hour to go further into. But today we view heat as a form of energy. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed, right? So the first law of dynamics is the law of conservation energy applied to thermal system. Heat necessarily can't be created or destroyed, but it can change forms and do things like work. So by systems, we mean any group of atoms, molecules, particles, objects, bodies, right? The system may be steam in a steam engine, the whole Earth's atmosphere, or even the body of a living creature. It's really important to define what is contained with the system as well as outside of it. So if we add heat to a system, the added energy either does one of two things. It either increases the internal energy of the object or it does work. Think about this for yourself. If you take in food, 
right? So you eat whatever you prefer to eat. I don't know. Like I, you eat a um, Nature's Valley granola bar. When you eat that food, your body takes on energy because that food gets broken down by your body into energy that's going to be used for ATP. So one of two things can occur. You can either take that energy and store it for later use, right, which happens, or you can use that energy and maybe work out. So it can either be stored and increase the internal energy of the object, or it can be used to do work. Maybe you need to eat that food so that you can go work out. Then it's going to get used. So one of the two happens. It either gets stored or gets used. So the first law of thermodynamics says, if you add heat to an, an object or heat to a system, it is either an increase internal energy, do external work, or both, right? Because if I eat a granola bar, could I use some of that energy and also store some of that energy for later if I don't use all of it? That works, right? right? I don't have to use all of the energy that I consume. And most of the time, we don't. But right? most of the time, we tend to eat more calories than we need. So let's say we have an air-filled, rigid, airtight can on a hot plate, and you add energy to the can. Caution, please do not do this. The can itself has a fixed volume. So let's say we take a can, and it's filled with, I don't know. Let me use soda as an example, because I have plenty of those soda cans here. And I take that soda can, and I put it on my stove. And I turn the stove up to max. Right? The can itself has a fixed volume. As I'm adding heat to that can, the internal energy, the actual fluid inside the can, is going to gain energy. That can has a certain amount of fixed volume for it, right? As that can increases the internal energy, increases the internal energy, those molecules start vibrating faster and faster and faster. What's going to eventually happen to that can? As I add more and more heat to it. What do you guys think? A weak point will give, right? It'll blow up potentially. Exactly. Right, Catherine? What do you want to do? Either Josh is right, like a weak point will give on the can and stuff will seep out, or boom. Um, one of my friends did this a long time ago. Um, we were camping up in uh, Utah. And for whatever reason, he thought it'd be funny to throw a can of compressed air into the, the campfire and didn't tell anyone. Yeah, that's a really smart idea. Major boom, exactly. Always funny, exactly, it's hilarious. The thing literally exploded and the best part was it shredded through his tent. So none of us were sad about that. He caused it on himself. Um, but the can exploded because what happened is even those air molecules, even though they're small and the can may not have been fully full, as the internal energy in that can increased, eventually it has to escape because it can only take on so much energy. So let's say we replace that with a balloon. And we take the balloon and we slowly heat it up. As the air heats, the exerting force on the outside of the balloon will actually expand, right? So that balloon will get bigger as it heats up. And some of you may have seen this, and I don't know if any of you have had kids, but maybe you've got a balloon at the fair for your kid. And you take it home, and you take it home, and when it comes into your apartment, because your apartment air condition is on, the balloon kind of shrivels up a little bit. Right, because it's cooler in the house than it was outside. Or maybe you fill up a balloon on the inside of your house, you take it outside for a birthday party, and all of a sudden you're sitting there and it's taped to the side of a table, and all of a sudden the balloon goes pop because you've heated that balloon up. Either energy is being added to it or it's you know gonna do work on the system, is kind of the idea. So steam engines were kind of the first major technology we developed, right? Steam engines helped us design the United States, really, when you think about it. If we didn't have the steam engines, I don't know where we'd be. Um, and now there's a whole um, given genre of comics and nerdery to this with steampunk, right? I don't know if any of you are interested in that. But basically, steampunk is basically getting stuck there. No problem, JT. So when a given quantity of heat is supplied to a steam engine, some of the heat increases the internal temperature of the steam. The rest is transformed into mechanical work and pushes the steam engine piston outward. Pistons cause compression in an engine, much like the compression in your car. 
and it rotates a drive shaft, and then the train goes choo 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 down the line. Okay. So the first law of thermodynamics is basically just the thermal design of conservation of energy. That's all it really comes down to. So adding heat is not the only way to increase the internal energy of a system though, right? If we set the heat added part of the law to zero, changes in internal energy are equal to the work done on the system. So what that's saying is if we do work on a system, we can also change the internal energy. of it. So for example, if I take a balloon and I squeeze it, and I do work on the system, the internal energy of the balloon is actually going to increase because the compression is gonna move all those molecules closer, those molecules are gonna bang off each other. And actually, if you're able to look at the balloon from a, like an infrared or a flare camera, you'll see that the actual internal temperature of the balloon will increase, right? So if I add 10 joules of energy to a system that does no internal work, the internal energy is gonna increase by 10 joules. If I add 10 joules and five joules of it is used for work, then the internal energy is gonna be increased by five joules. It's gonna be proportional is what I'm saying. So then we get this process called an adiabatic process. So this is not adiabetic. Adiabetic is somebody that can't control their blood sugar. Adiabatic is when we do work on a system by moving gas or compressing gas. So when works done on a gas by adiabatically compressing it, the gas gains internal energy and becomes warmer. When gas is compressed or expanded so that heat enters or leaves the system, the process is called adiabatic. The adiabatic change to the volume can be achieved by performing the rot process rapidly so the heat has little time to enter or leave the system. So a common example of this process is the compression and expansion of gases in the cylinder of the engine. I know none of you cared and really wanted to know how your car works. You just knew that it works. Well, we're going to get a little physics lesson on that, right? In the cars, compression and expansion occur in only a few hundredths of a second, too fast for heat to energy to leave the combustion chamber, and that causes energy to actually move your car, right? Uh, for very high compression engines, something like a diesel engine on a truck, um, maybe some of you have a diesel truck, I don't know, or maybe you, you, you know somebody that has one. In those trucks, they don't need a spark plug. So there's no spark plugs in most diesel trucks because the compression, those pistons being driven is so high, the actual compression of those gas molecules causes the gas molecules to explode on their own. And that causes the diesel engine to actually produce energy. It also causes it to produce some nasty smoke too, right? So this is kind of looking at how that internal engine of your car works. First of all, there's an intake. Air and fuel enter the piston chamber, right? And the piston moves up and compresses the mixture. The spark plug then causes just a little bit of a spark to occur on that compressed fuel and air mixture. And when that happens, an explosion occurs. Those, the gas suddenly rapidly expands. And when it rapidly expands, it drives the piston down. It's called the power stroke. That power stroke is going to push the piston down, which will help drive your drive chain, push your car forward. And then that gas is going to escape as exhaust. And the process is going to repeat over and over and over again. Some cars will actually increase their compression in order to get a little bit more energy out of it by doing things like putting a supercharger or a turbocharger on their car. So a little bit of humor, because I like to add humor to everything. If somebody runs behind a car, you'll become exhausted. If you run in front of a car, you'll soon become tired. Mm -hmm. Think about it a second. Get it? Okay, fine. No one's awake. All right, appreciate it, Sean. So adiabatic gas actually is how the atmosphere works, right? There are air blobs in our atmosphere. I know this is really kind of scientific. There are air blobs. Those air blobs flow up the side of the mountain as pressure lessens, allows it to expand and cool. The reduced pressure results in reduced temperature, right? We know that as we go up a kilometer, and for every kilometer that we go up in distance, the temperature goes down by about 10 degrees Celsius. So if it's 100 degrees here, you know, let's say, so it is currently about what, it's 112 outside, so that's about... 39 degrees Celsius-ish, right? So let's say it's 40 degrees Celsius outside. That's pretty warm. 
if we go up one kilometer in the air, it's actually only 30 degrees Celsius there. If we go up two kilometers, 20 degrees Celsius. As you keep going up for every kilometer you go up, it gets colder and colder, right? This is one of the reasons I kind of, I was thinking about this, like what happened? You know, we've had seen airlines where like a, something, thank you Southwest, the hole opens up in the airplane. You know, if you're at 30,000 feet at that point, the air that's gonna come rushing in that airplane is going to be super cold compared to what's inside the cabin, right? That's why once an airplane goes up in the air, right? Has anyone ever done this? Get on the airplane here in Las Vegas, and when it's sitting on the runway, it's god awful hot. And then by the time you get up in the air, it's starting to get cool. What's well, because it's starting to filter in some air from the outside, which is actually a lot colder than the air was on the ground. So as we go up, temperature changes. So this happens as air flows over tall mountains, right? We have that here in Las Vegas. Most of the climate coming into here has to get by all of the mountains around Las Vegas and to get into our valley. So air at 25 degrees Celsius at ground level would be 35 degrees or minus 35 degrees at six kilometers up, right? And then as the air decreases, it's gonna roast up and increase that temperature. That's called the Chinook wind that we talk about that brings those nice winds across the Great Plains and allows the Great Plains to be an area of kind of like a fertile crescent of the United States where we can grow a lot of food, right? So even during kind of winter, we get kind of a little bit of mild temperatures in that area, even though it's kind of cold in areas like Denver and that. So the second law of thermodynamics states that heat will never flow itself from cold to a hot object. We talked about this already, right? If a hot brick is next to a cold brick, the heat will flow from the hot brick to the cold brick. If the hot brick takes energy from the cold brick and becomes hotter, the first law of thermodynamics is not violated, but the second law would be. So the second law states heat doesn't flow from cold to hot. It just doesn't. Unless we add energy, right? So let's, again, we're talking about in winter, heat flows from the inside of a warm heated home to the outside cold air. In summer, heat flows from the hot outside into the inside. Heat can be made to flow the other way, but only by imposing an internal energy, which is what happens with heat pumps. I don't know what kind of heating system you have in your home. I know I have a heat pump here in my apartment, right? Heat pumps are great at lowering the internal energy of your home. The downside is they're usually pretty inefficient, which means that my electric bill is usually a little bit higher than other people's, right? You have to use a ton of energy in order to get the heat so you know so the heat flows from the colder internal here outside so that it stays even colder in here the ocean itself is a great idea of this the great the energy itself of the ocean is a giant heat pump there's a ton of internal energy in the ocean but because it's got all that energy we can't use that to even light up a single flashlight bulb or anything like that because the heat's going to stay inside the ocean without actually causing some sort of external energy. So energy will not flow from lower temp to higher temp unless there's some sort of energy imparted upon it as well. So according to the second law of thermodynamics, no heat engine can convert all heat input to mechanical energy. That's right, we're gonna lose some of that to other types of transfer. We're gonna use some of it to do work, right? An easy exchange of work completely heat is just simply rubbing your hands together, right? As I'm rubbing my hands together, I can feel my hands start to get warm. Yes, Daniel San, right? I just made a 80s reference movie there for those of you that don't know. However, changing heat completely into work cannot completely occur. So we can't, even our cars, right? When we cause those gas chambers and the pistons to explode and cause energy to happen, our cars are never gonna be 100% efficient, right? We just, we're just not there yet and probably never will be. So that means some of that gas that goes into your car is still gonna be spent off on heat. And you can see that if you open up your hood on a really hot day, your engine is super warm, right? So the best that can be done is convert some of the energy into mechanical work. So a heat engine is any device that changes internal energy into mechanical work. The basic idea between a heat engine is that mechanical work can be obtained as heat flows from higher temperatures to lower temperatures. And some of that heat can be transformed into work as we do it. When we talk about heat engines, we're going to talk about reservoirs or areas of storage. We're going to have an area of cool storage and an area of hot storage. 
that heat is going to flow out of the high temperature reservoir into the heat engine and then into the low temperature reservoir and then back through to allow the work to occur. So as heat engines will increase internal energy by absorbing a heat reservoir, then convert some of it into work, and then expel the remaining energy as heat. That's what your car engine does. When heat flows in any heat engine from high temperature to low temperature, part of that energy is going to be used into work. That's the idea of that piston being pushed down. So Carnot was the one that kind of analyzed this heat engine, which is where we get Carnot efficiency from. What he says is that as we put, as we do this change of energy from a high temperature to low temperature, there's going to be an efficiency of engines, meaning that your engine is either going to be 20, 30, 40, 50% efficient. No engine will ever be 100% efficient because some of that work that's going to be done is always going to escape as heat. So Carnot's equation states that the upper limit of efficiency for heat engines is somewhere around 99%. We're never going to hit 100%. If we have higher operating temperatures, right? For example, your air conditioner. If you go up and look at the unit on the outside of your air conditioner, that air conditioner unit is very, very, very warm. The idea behind that is the warmer it gets, the more energy it can create. Therefore, it can pull more energy out of your environment that you're in now if you have a heat pump. Right. Only some of the heat input can be converted to work, even without considering friction. So we're never going to be 100 percent effective because some of the heat is going to escape. And then the third law of dynamics states that no system can reach absolute zero. That kind of makes sense. If we reach absolute zero, we really don't know what would happen. Because as we get closer and closer, we've gotten down to about a millionth of a Kelvin degree or Kelvin to absolute zero. but We haven't reached absolute zero. It's kind of like well, we still haven't found dark matter on Earth and stuff like that because we really don't know what will happen once we get there. And this is something that bothers people that aren't interested in this. They're like, well, how can you say that absolute zero equals is true if you've never reached it? Well, we know it's there. It's just by the current laws of physics, we still can't reach it. So that leads me to the, my fun topics for the day, order to disorder. Natural systems tend to proceed towards a state of greater disorder. How many of you guys have kids in here? A couple of you I know. I think Stephanie might have kids. Two, right? All right, Scott, so let me ask you. Let me use you as an example because you're the first one to respond. What would happen, what would your house look like if you started today, you decided you were not going to ever clean your house for a month? With your kids, what would that? It would be look? horrible. It'd it would be, be horrible. horrible. We're all grown up now, but when they were young, it'd be horrible. Yeah, it'd be a disaster, right? The natural state of things is we tend towards disorder. Even if it'll be a dump, right, Stephanie? Right? Even myself, and I live in my apartment by myself here. Even if I didn't clean my apartment and I was just me, eventually this place would be a disaster because things trend, trend tend towards disorder, right? So the first law of thermodynamics says that energy cannot be created nor destroyed, it just changes form. The second law states that whenever energy transforms, some of it degenerates into waste heat. And so what we look at then is that organized usable energy will always generate into disorganized non-usable energy. And then it's unavailable for reusing for work again. So organized energy in the form of electricity that goes into heating lights in the home degenerates into heat energy, right? Our old incandescent light bulbs those old style light bulbs, right? Before our LEDs and everything we have now. I don't know if you guys remember, but when I grew up, those things were warm. They put off a ton of heat, right? But now our LEDs are a little bit less effective than that, right? Um, this is the Transamerica Pyramid in San Francisco. And actually in that building, there's no heaters in the building itself. The building is entirely heated by the lights that are in the building itself which is amazing, right? So that means those lights give off that much heat that they never need to actually provide any heating for the building. My apartment, I never run the heater in winter because honestly, my computer that's sitting beside me puts off enough heat that my office is constantly at a comfortable temperature. And like right now, so I started at about 76.5 degrees and I'm already up to 78.6 in here just from turning the computer on for a little while. 
So we see that the quality of energy is lowered with each transformation. As energy can, tends to move further down in its disorganized state, it becomes more and more disorganized. If we imagine that I put a, in this corner of my room here, I put a jar filled with argon gas atoms, and then I open up the lid, the argon gas atoms are going to move haphazardly throughout the room. They're going to spread randomly throughout the room, mixing with the air and the molecules in the room. And if we look at the uh, glass jar, then after opening that lid, what we find is all the molecules that were in the jar are gone. All right, that flopped. It's much better in person. So that means that systems tend to move from an ordered state, concentrated in a jar, to a more disorganized state around the room, right? The argon atoms are not spontaneously moved back into the jar. That doesn't happen, right? The number of ways the argon atoms can randomly move, the, practice, the practicality of them actually returning to the jar are almost zero. There's no chance that, you know, there's no chance that you could take and swing around a jar and the only thing you're going to gather up are oxygen molecules. That's not the way things work because there is a chaos effect going on, right? So according to the second law of thermodynamics, in the long run, entropy of a system always increases for natural process. Entropy is the measure amount of disorder in a system. As disorder increases, entropy increases, right? Have you guys heard about entropy? It's not what it used to be. Oh, 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 fine. My physics jokes are flopping today hardcore. So if you think about like back where I'm from, we have a lot of barns back where I'm from, but if they don't get taken care of, eventually you end up with these big old rundown barns where everything's kind of falling apart. And I remember like growing up, you used to be able to see that one barn that was in your town that was on an old farm that no one took care of anymore. You know, that haunted barn that no one wanted to go into on Halloween because the ghosts were in there and there's some witch that lives there. And God only knows what else small town people say about a rundown barn or rundown house. But as time goes on, that barn decays and decays and decays and decays and breaks down. And eventually, right, eventually, it's going to decay into just basically molecules or dirt that goes into the ground, as long as it's made of something like wood or substances that can break down. That's why it's amazing when you think about it that we have the pyramids the way they are, right? Because the Great Pyramids are a testament to our building ability from a long time ago, but yet they're still there because the, the material they are made out of doesn't tend towards disorder as fast. Um, there is a great video or a great show that was on, I think it was on the Weather Channel or whatever, is, is called After Humans or After Life or something like that, where the whole premise of the show would show a different area, what would happen if human life ended in that area? And they did a special in Las Vegas here. And it's kind of interesting when you see that because if at about five years out of Las Vegas here, what do you think is going to happen if all human life left Las Vegas? What do you think this place is going to look like in five years? Anyone have an idea? Maybe some of you saw the Resident Evil movie that happened here. The desert is eventually going to take this place back over. Yeah, dirt, right? This place will eventually be covered back in the desert, right? We'll trend back to it, lots of it, yeah, right? We'll be, we'll be back to having dunes throughout the city. It'll look more like the rest of the area around the city, right? This area is not necessarily conducive to human life, let's just face it. I mean, nothing grows in our dirt, it's just kind of sand, right? So again, if you didn't clean your house, your house would look like nasty in a year if you didn't clean it for the whole year. Entropy normally increases in physical systems. So if we do work though, such as in living organisms, entropy decreases. Let's think about your bones, for example. If you did nothing to maintain, maintain your bones, if you just sat and were a sloth and just sat in your chair for a year, your bones would deteriorate. They would trend towards entropy. They would literally start breaking down. You'd have osteoporosis, right? So how do we reduce that breakdown? We, if you work out, you move, that helps keep the ent entropy of your body breaking down. And we know this in physical therapy because we know 
if patients exercise, they are less likely to not only get injured, but also kind of succumb to the natural effects of aging. Now, we will all eventually age and there's no way out of it. Uh, I know this comes as a huge blow to some of you young folks, but you will eventually end up to, you know, my level where when you wake up, everything kind of hurts in the morning. We will naturally trend towards breaking down. There's no way to stop that at this point, but we can slow that effect down. All living things extract energy from the surrounding areas and use it to increase their own organization. Orders maintain by increasing entropy elsewhere. So as we steal energy from somewhere else, as we eat food, right, we create waste. That would be an entropic desire. <laughs> I don't know. If you know. Even he will eventually break down. I'm just saying. Give him another couple of years. I'd love to see what the actual bones of that guy looks like, though. Like the actual x-rays of that, that would be kind of interesting. So I'd be curious to see what the osteoporotic effects of the bones are. I don't know. That's just me. For our system, life plus their waste products, there's a net increase in entropy, right? We, is he dead? Oh, you might be right. Oh, I might be an idiot. I'm probably an idiot. Um, yeah, anyway. But energy must, must be transformed in the living system to support life, right? When there's not energy, energy organism soon dies. The Tamagotchi is a great example of this. I don't know if any of you had this when you were growing up or if you had any kids that had these stupid things, but I, I, you know, back when I started treating their, all the kids, that was all the rage for kids. They had those stupid little Tamagotchi things. And uh, Kayla's like, yeah, right? What happened if you ignored your Tamagotchi? They die, yeah, right? That was literally... Well, that, uh, that kills my mood there, Josh. I'm sorry, I did not realize. <laughs> so he has, a, he has trended towards entropy. I'm just saying. Um, but Tamagotchi, is, I, I use that as an example because if you don't put work into taking care of that Tamagotchi, it's going to die. Same thing with like a pet. If you don't care for your pet, pet's eventually going to die. Right? You have to give energy onto it, right? So... The, there's an age-old question, how do you unscramble an egg? Well, technically, the answer to that is feed it to a chicken. You won't get the original egg back, but more eggs will be created. I mean, that's kind of creepy to think of, right? Because technically, that's cannibalism, right? Isn't it? I mean, chicken's eating its own offspring. I don't know. Anyway, but technically, if you feed a chicken an egg, the egg will come back as another egg. So the first law of thermodynamics is a universal law of nature, which there are no exceptions. The second law is a probability state, meaning that disordered states are much more probable, right? It is, thank you, I'm glad somebody said, to me that's interesting to think about, but it's kind of weird too. Disordered states are much more probable than ordered states, right? Even the most improbable states may occur and entropy spontaneously decreases. There's a haphazard in motion of molecules could momentarily become harmonious in a corner of a room. Barrel of pennies dumped on the floor could show all heads, not likely. A breeze may come through your room all of a sudden and organize your whole room. I mean, that's possible. Probably not likely. I keep hoping that for my office. I keep hoping that my air conditioner will eventually just blow through here and organize my desk. Um, more likely, it's just going to blow through everything and put it on the floor. And I'll be like, hey, my desk is clean. The odds of those things happening are infinitesimally small. So the law of thermodynamics sometimes put it this way. Right. Well, first of all, you can't win because you can't get more energy out of something that you can't that you put in. You can't break even because you can't even get as much energy out as you put in, and you can't get out of the game. Entropy is always in the universe increasing. Uh, radioactive decay is a great example of this disorder, right? But the big question is: if a cat is radioactive, does it have 18 half lives? Try to add humor to this and it's failing miserably. So the near unanimous, and this is going to lead towards climate change here. So if you are a person that doesn't believe in this, I'm sorry, I can't really help you here. Climate change is real. It's universally agreed upon by 99.9% .9 
of the scientists out there. We used to call this, um, what do we call this? Uh, God, what was, I forget, something to do with heat. I can't remember what it was right now. Uh, global warming, there we go, global warming. Thank you, Josh, I appreciate it, right? We used to call this global warming, but then we had people that came into Congress and are like, do you see this snowball? There's a snowball in DC, so therefore global warming's not happening. No, that, that, that's, that's not how this works. That's, that's not, I, I need that, like, that meme of those old ladies with the Facebook thing. That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works, right? An automobile sitting in a bright sun on a hot day with windows rolled up can get very hot inside. This is an example of the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is the warming of planet's surface due to the trapping of radiation by the planet's atmosphere. All things radiate heat, right? And the frequency and wavelength that radiation depends upon the temperature of the object emitting radiation. And you can tell this, right? Have any of you left your home to get out of the strip? And when you get down to the strip, it feels way hotter than it did at home. At home. Have any of you ever experienced that? Like maybe you go down to visit friends that are down on the strip and you get down there and it just feels like the strip, right? All the people mouth breathing. There is that as well, right? But the other thing is we've created an artificial environment down there, right? Because we have all those really tall buildings and all those buildings absorb heat. And then we have all that concrete down there that absorbs heat. And so we've created a little mini climate down there that it's always a little bit warmer down there in the strip than it is on the outskirts of town. Uh, same thing happens in New York, same thing happens in most other major cities, right? So the transparency of things such as air and glass depend upon the wavelength of radiation. Air itself is transparent to both infrared, long waves, and visible short waves. So as the air contains an excess amount of carbon dioxide and water vapor, it will absorb infrared rays, right? So this kind of helps create a, this global climate effect, right? So why does a car get hot and bright sunlight? Well, the wavelengths of the waves of the sun radiate are very short. These short waves easily pass through the window, right? But as it gets inside, it gets absorbed by the interior. And when it gets absorbed by the interior, so with the exception of some reflection, it gets absorbed, the car's interior warms up. As that interior warms up, it starts radiating its own waves. But those waves, because they're not as warm as the sun, are a lot longer. And then those waves go and hit your window, and the window doesn't allow those heat waves to re-escape, and so those waves bounce back in. And so then more short waves come in and more heat up the car. And so the interior just kind of builds up this radiating area. So then if you have a car, how do you keep the interior car from getting so hot? What could you do to it? Tint, right? Specifically with really high quality tint, right? You know, just that average off the shelf Walmart tint probably is not going to be able to help you. You could crack the window, exactly, Josh, right? Even if you just open it just a small amount, because we know that heat is going to try to flow from hot to cooler area. And even if you crack that window, the outside itself is going to be cooler than the inside of your car. So heat's going to try to escape through that little crack. But certain forms of tint have specific molecules in it to reflect those long wave rays of the sun. And that'll help keep it a little cooler. The other thing you do is put up one of those stupid window shades, right? And that'll help reflect some of that sun and keep your car a little cooler. But all of it are ways to keep your car cooler, especially during our really hot summer days. The other thing that does when you do stuff like that is it does protect your interior of your cars, right? Because as those areas heat up, it causes stuff like your dash and your seats to crack. Well, the Earth's atmosphere is a lot like a car. So the Earth's sun or the Earth's surface absorbs the energy and re radiates part of the sun's waves at larger wavelength. The atmosphere's gases, mainly water vapor, carbon dioxide, and methane, which is most of what our atmosphere is contained of, are able to allow the sun waves, which are really, really short waves, to pass through. But as it gets absorbed by the Earth and reflected back up, those waves increase in length. And our atmosphere then reflects those waves back in. Right? So it can't escape the Earth's atmosphere. Without this warming process, actually, if we didn't have an atmosphere, so if we got rid of our atmosphere right now, the Earth's temperature would be minus 18 degrees Celsius. And there are all kinds of things that could cause the atmosphere to go away, like if all of a sudden rotation of the Earth stopped, 
then gravity is going to be affected. The atmosphere is actually going to escape and go off into space and spread out as fast as it can. And suddenly the Earth is going to freeze. Like literally, it will freeze pretty quickly. But the increased levels of carbon dioxide and other atmospheric gases may further increase temperature. It's going to create an unfavorable temperature balance here in the Earth, right? The Earth's temperature depends upon the energy balance between the incoming solar radiation, the amount of radiation going out as extraterrestrial radiation coming from Earth. So there is kind of a one-way valve. It allows heat in, but it's not allowing a lot of heat out right now, right? So over the few years, solar radiation strikes the Earth, balances terrestrial radiation, we kind of even out. But as we increase that carbon dioxide period, the Earth's temperature is going to be changed, right? It, by natural causes of human activity. We have drastically increased the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere just because we've become more industrialized. Right? A lot of our cars give off carbon monoxide, which readily absorbs another oxygen molecule and creates carbon dioxide. There's a lot of natural causes. How, do, how does methane increase in the sky? Does anyone know? Do humans give off methane? Cows in one way, yeah. Humans give off methane. Right, Sean's like, yeah, right? We give off methane, right? Our, that some of our byproduct of digestion, that's why people say cows, right? Um, byproduct of digestion is methane. We give it off, that's what makes people have really gaseous emissions. Well, cows have a lot of gaseous emissions because they eat a lot of vegetables, which creates a lot of methane. Now, cows themselves are not responsible for this. Right? Don't get me wrong. Cows are not, it's not that necessarily it's cows. What it is, is our meat consumption has gone up so much that we need more cows. And so we breed more cows, which then increases methane. So technically, yes, cows increase methane, but in reality, it's humans increase methane. Right? Let's just face it. We, we are a little bit parasitic to our world is a good way of looking at it, right? So burning fossil fuels also then increases carbon dioxide and or carbon dioxide in the air, which is also going to further create the absorption and reflection of some of the solar radiation. Earth is going to constantly add that heat, right? So activity can change radioactive balance and change Earth's average temperature. Although water vapor is the main greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide is the most rapidly increasing greenhouse gas right now. And with further warming by CO2, we produce water vapor as well. So as we do this, if CO2 increases in the atmosphere, and block some of that radiation escaping. Well, now some of that radiation is going to bounce back and heat up our oceans, right? We know that the oceans are heating up in temperature. As those oceans heat up, it creates more water vapor. That water vapor will travel up into the atmosphere. That atmosphere then gets thicker, which increases the reflection of the heat, which then increases the production of water vapor, which is this vicious cycle, right? Now, is climate change cyclical? I will say, yes, climate change is cyclical, meaning that the Earth goes through periods of heat up and cool down, and heat up and cool down, and heat up and cool down, right? But when we talk about climate change in this method, what it's basically saying is that we are rapidly speeding up that period of heat up. And although I'm afraid of that period of heat up, my main concern is what happens when we get to the period of cool down, because humans aren't designed to survive an ice age, right? And throughout the Earth's history, we can see there have been global times of ice age in different areas. So that's one of the things we're worried about. How we can use some of that is solar power, right? More energy from the sun hits the Earth in an hour than all the energy consumed by humans in a year. Therefore, solar energy can be a real life solution to fossil fuels. And we know this, we can actually use some of that to help reduce our byproduct or our effect on the environment by reducing some of our coal burning specifically. The other side effect is right now is, do we have a finite amount of coal and petroleum? Meaning that is there a limit to how much petroleum and coal we can pull out of the earth? Yeah, right? Eventually we're gonna hit a point where we may not find any more coal. 
or we may not find any more petroleum because that's just kind of the way it works. That could put us in a real concern, right? Um, and so we have to think about that when we're dealing with this type of stuff. So those are those assessment questions. I know that I kind of preached a little bit about climate change and I'm sorry if that offended any of you, but it is a kind of realistic thing that's going on right now. Now, is it gonna affect in Mark's lifetime? Maybe not, right? It may, you know, and, and it's kind of, I, that's one of the things that I kind of get a little concerned with and I don't have kids. So I don't really have to worry about what my kids are eventually gonna have to deal with because, well, I don't have them. But I have godchildren, I have nieces, I have nephews, and I worry about what our Earth's going to look like in 100 years, right? Uh, let's just think about this just logically for a second. What happens if the oceans rise by two feet? Is that going to drastically change the, our world? Yeah, I mean, yeah, right? Think about, uh, think about the waters in New York raising by two feet. A lot of Manhattan's going to be gone. Right? And you can see this, we, we don't need to create this, see that if you ever need to see it, look at what's going on in countries like Bangladesh, where most of the country is below sea level. Bangladesh itself is flooded most of the time, most of the year now, because of sea level change, right? Miami, I don't know if any, again, I, I said this in the last lecture, Miami itself, if you go down there, there are certain areas of Miami now that during high tide are underwater, which is crazy to me because I went down there, you know, 15 years ago and it wasn't like that, right? It's, it's kind of scary. And what the problem there becomes is if ocean levels rise, people have to move in. Are we slowing down population growth? No, right? We're not slowing down population growth, which means that we only have a finite amount of area inside, right? I mean, theoretically, if you want to play the long game, the smart idea would be to buy a lot of land on the interior of the United States, because eventually that's going to be really kind of worth a lot of money. I'm just saying like that area, you, you buy some land in like Idaho or stuff like that, where you're away from the oceans, that's eventually going to be even here, actually, like something like Pahrump or something like that in the outskirts of Las Vegas, eventually that land's going to be needed. Um, now, could we do stuff to slow this down? Sure, we can. We can reduce our greenhouse gases. Right? We can reduce stuff like that. We can change the more fossil fuels, but we also have to be careful because I don't think all electric vehicles are the answer either because do electric vehicles create their own problems? Okay, yeah, right. What kind of problems do, do we like, if, you, if we went to all electric vehicles, will we run into? Does anyone know? Inefficient batteries, right, good. And the other side effect is we're actually creating an illegal trade right now of lithium and ion, or the lithium, right? Sean, that's that's the new, I don't forget, have you guys, have you guys ever seen the movie Blood Diamond? About the illegal, Mark's shaking his head, right? Right, about the illegal diamond trade. It's a great movie, it's kind of creepy too, but it's a great movie, right? But nowadays in Africa, it's not necessarily diamond that's being traded, it's lithium is the same way now, right? Because there's a large deposit of lithium in Africa. We actually just discovered um, in the Salton Sea, I, I keep talking about this because I have a friend that works down in the Salton Sea. He's doing a lot of Native American research down there and I've been down there a few times. Cell phones, right, exactly, right? It's not eco-friendly to find you. Yeah, it's right. We're not, we're not taking care of the earth finding, right? The Salton Sea, we just found a huge deposit of lithium down there. So that may revive that whole area. It's not a very hospitable place to live, but it may revive the whole area, right? Um, and which was a weapons testing facility back in the days. So yeah, I don't think electric vehicles are all those solution either. And we've got to have a multifaceted approach here. We can't just attack it from one direction, right? We've got to have a kind of multifaceted look at how to do this. We also can't just deny it either. We can't just say, well, we'll, we'll get to it later because we've already increased the temperature of the earth. We know it's going to keep going up. And eventually, again, like I said, yeah, I'm worried about this going up, but what I'm really worried about is when we start going like this. When the greenhouse gases get so much that heat no longer enters the earth, because that's eventually going to happen, right? We'll eventually increase greenhouse gases so much that the only heat in the earth is coming from the radiation of the earth. Uh, natural gas does give off, so the good news about natural gas is it 
does give off less fossil fuels than something like oil or coal. So yes, in a way it is better. And the other thing about natural gas is, Josh, we can use it multiple times. So that's part of the good bonus of it. Like we can use actual natural gas to produce natural gas and also to extract natural gas. The downside to that is how we retrieve the natural gas because a lot of it comes from fracking and that can damage the earth as well. So we've got, this is one of those where we're like, we found a solution and broke five other things. Um, and and if, in reality, I'm not joking about us being kind of predatory on our world. Um, I, I was actually listening to a TED talk from a, an ecologist, an ecologist that talked about it. And he was talking about the rising temperatures in the earth. And he brought up a really good point. He said, how does your body get rid of a pathogen? So say you, like, say right now you get a virus, what happens to your body temperature? It goes up, right? And so the thought process said is, is, well, what if this is the earth having a fever and the earth is literally saying we're the pathogen? It's actually not a, was that not, I didn't really have to see that then. Uh, that's interesting. It's, it's an interesting thought process, right? To think about the fact that maybe the earth is saying, look, you know, you're the, you're the disease on the planet right now if you don't change things. Um, I don't have the answer for it. I'm not saying I have the answer. It's just an interesting thought process. Um, I know that I, I, it, it's kind of, again, my head kind of hurts that we actually had a congressman ask if, I don't know if any of you saw the video of this. If you haven't, I highly recommend you going and seeing it, where the congressman asked the Department of the Interior and also the Bureau of Land Management, have you thought of moving the earth? No, no, we can't move the earth. That, that, that's not the way this works. That's not how any of this works. If we could move the earth, right, Alex laughing, right? If we could move the earth, we actually could affect climate change a little bit because we can move the earth a little bit further away from the sun. But the downside to that is if we don't decrease carbon emissions, we'll still eventually get that cool down period. So yeah, it'll solve one short-term problem, but could create a long-term problem. Um, is Mars an answer? I don't know. I mean, it could be, but the problem again with Mars is we'd have to send really young people there to get it. And I'm going to be hundred percent honest. One of my favorite shows to date is The Expanse. And if you haven't seen The Expanse, I highly recommend it. But it will show you what will happen if we colonize space. It's not going to change very much from the way we are right now. Um, the interesting thing about that is one of the things that's kind of interesting about space that may be interesting or maybe functional for us is there's a lot of fresh water in space, believe it or not. There's a lot of fresh, clean water floating on the asteroid belt in big, huge chunks of ice. So theoretically, that may solve some of our fresh water problems here, if we can get that taken care of. That would be kind of, I mean, think about like a huge like ship full of fresh water coming down and being able to fill up the reservoir at Lake Mead. Like that to me is kind of interesting. Uh, desalination would be another kind of thought process. If we can come up with a way that's effective at desalinating the ocean, that maybe we could pump some of that internally into some of our reservoirs that are low, like Lake Mead, there's a couple of them in California. Another process that might help because then we can lower ocean levels as well as raise our functional water levels in, in the internal tables. So I don't know. That's my preaching for the day. Any questions? I'm done, I'm gonna get off my preachy soapbox. I'll stop recording here, so.